being here. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Jim. We are really glad to have you here. And before we uh, jump in, I'm going to go ahead and there's the bio for anyone who wants to uh, to read that. But we're going to go in and we're going to find the top top four facts that, that uh, Dr. Hackman shared with us. First, uh, MD FACS has served as a triad service line leader since 2014. His clinical interests include head and neck oncology, minimally invasive surgery, and reconstructive surgery. He is a professor of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery, and he is chief in the division of head and neck surgical oncology here at UNC. Dr. Hackman, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And tell, tell for our audience a little bit about your career trajectory. What, uh, what went on early on the, and, and what were the, the stepping stones for you educationally that got you to this point? Sure. So I, I'm the first uh, physician in my family. Uh, it was my mom was a nurse and I always had an, had an affinity for medicine and wanted to be a doctor since, since I was a little kid. Uh, and it was during my undergraduate training that I, I met somebody who was a physician who mentored me, and that kind of led me down the path of considering um, just medicine in general. Uh, one physician who gave me a year to work in his lab, and then found my way to medical school in Pittsburgh through just sort of serendipity. I, I was looking for the place that was the right fit for me, had friends that were out there, uh, found out that it was the med school that sort of recognized the college I went to, uh, knew my university, and then when I got there, I just found mentors. And that's sort of what I found in life is that you find mentors who are, who speak to you as far as the, their attendance or their quality of their life, the way they want to live their lives, um, what they're passionate about. And I just saw what they did and was so all-consuming, enjoyable for me. I love taking care of people. And so medicine was a great fit for me. And I just had great mentors who helped me get there along the path. And since then, I've been at UNC now since 2009. Uh, I've quickly quickly become the old man in our department, um, and I'm just happy to still be here. Great. Dr. Ackman, thank you, and I, I could not agree more about that, that uh, what you indicated about mentors and the importance of, of identifying mentors mm -hmm. in your life. Uh, let's see. Let's go ahead and take a look at there's the, the, the bio for Dr. Lumley, and then let's go to the top four. Uh, Catherine J. Lumley, MD, competed, completed a fellowship in head and neck oncology, microvascular reconstruction at UNC, completed a residency training in otolaryngology at Georgetown University, graduated with honors from Wayne State University School of Medicine in 2013, right down the road from the Michigan State University <laughs> where I went. And uh, uh, she is an assistant professor at the UNC Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. So welcome, and uh, just like I had asked um, Dr. Hackman, Dr. Lumley, what, what was your career trajectory that, that got you to this point? Um, initially when I was grade school probably, or young, you know, middle age, middle school probably, I was very active in sports, um, most notably soccer, and ended up having multiple injuries and had quite a few knee surgeries. And so that kind of sparked my interest in medicine, just having spent time with my surgeon and physical therapist and other people within the medical field and ended up um, shadowing many people. And therefore, similar to what Dr. Hackman said, kind of these people became my mentors and helped lead me towards medicine. Um, I went to Albion College in Michigan, which has a very good pre-medical um, undergraduate program, and that's also where I met many mentors that helped me, you know, led me the way and um, found myself uh, enjoying otolaryngology because of the patient population and the type of disease processes that we take care of and ended up here. Great. Thank yeah. you so much. Really appreciate your both being here. Uh, we do have that first poll everywhere question, what is one word that comes to mind when you hear the term head and neck cancer? So if our audience, uh, go ahead and, and uh, any one word, and I've got to moderate that, so bear with me for just mm -hmm. a moment. But any one word that comes to mind when you hear the term head and neck cancer, and we've got a few coming in, HPV, mm -hmm. throat, smoking. HPV is a little larger, so we're getting more on, on that. 
Maybe we don't need to give the talk. I yeah. think they kind of they, know. They got to come. That was really they, great. They, yeah. All them. right, y'all pass. Now, now they have a lot of, of, of great information to share with you. So uh, without further ado, caring for patients with head and neck cancers, I'll pass the controls. So sure. So Dr. Lumley and I will be sort of splitting the talk through. We'll try to move through a lot of content because that's a broad subject, as you'll find. Um, uh, we're going to try to review kind of what makes up our patient population, who are we taking care of, um, review a little bit like how do we work these patients up, how do we take care of them, what is the management for these patients, um, and it's typically a multidisciplinary team, it's not just the surgeons, and then sort of the, the challenges of survivorship, how we manage these patients afterwards, and they become lifelong patients of ours. Um, a little bit about sort of what we call the epidemiology of, of head and neck cancer. It is not a common one in the U.S. When you compare it to things like breast and lung and colon that have hundreds of thousands of cases, um, we're a smaller cancer population. Um, but when you compare it to worldwide, it is a very big problem worldwide. Uh, typically, as people wrote in the um, full first poll everywhere, smoking is a big thing we think about with a lot of our head and neck cancers, especially historically. But even now, we're seeing viruses as a cause, such as HPV that was written in the poll everywhere. Um, the Epstein-Barr virus is sometimes associated with cancers, and that's usually overseas. Uh, and then sun exposure, immunocompromised, because again, head and neck cancer includes skin cancer, um, more common in men. And we're going to talk mostly about the air digestive tract. So if you'll see here, we're going to focus basically on the tongue, the oral cavity, larynx and salivary glands. As you can see, we could be talking about the sinuses, the skull base, a lot of other things, but in an hour, that's a lot to cover. Um, so, as mentioned earlier, smoking is probably historically been one of the top things linked with head and neck cancer, very much similar in line with lung cancer. Uh, we know that uh, people who smoke uh, 30 plus cigarettes a day have a fourfold increased risk of cancer. The good news though, even though smoking is associated with cancer and that associated with alcohol has a combined effect that actually increases the risk significantly, 35 uh, fold, uh, if you stop smoking, within roughly 20 years, your risk goes down to almost close to that of the native population. So smoking may be something that triggers cancer, but we know that if we get people to successfully undergo tobacco cessation, that within a few decades, they can have risk factors that profile somebody who's a non-smoker. And so that's our goal is to try and see how we can educate people to prevent the cancer uh, rather than just having to treat it when it happens. So again, we'll cover the, the, the sub-sites that are in bold. That, that'll still be a lot to cover to kind of give you a descriptive as to who we take care of and, and what makes up those patient populations. And without further ado, I'll have Dr. Lumley sort of take off and take the lead on oral cavity, which will be our first subsite. So as Dr. Hackman mentioned, um, this is a broad uh, area basically to cover, but we'll kind of focus on the oral cavity, which is essentially the mouth. Um, within the oral cavity, there are multiple different subsites. So there's um, the buccal mucosa, which is the lining of your cheek. Mucosa is just the basically mu mucosal lining or lining essentially of your mouth. Um, so buccal mucosa is your cheek. You have your tongue, the floor of mouth, which is the lining underneath your tongue, your lips, rectum trigone, which is described as basically kind of behind these lower teeth back here, and then you have one up on the top as well, and then your hard palate, which is the roof of your mouth. And that's where we see what we call oral cavity cancer. It falls under this classification. On the right, you can see a couple of kind of pictures, a classic up top of an oral cavity cancer, and then potentially a pre-cancer lesion here on the, on the bottom. Generally, patients are presenting with a few different um, symptoms, especially if it's early, so a non-healing ulcer, um, such as what you basically will look like a yellow kind of lesion um, on your tongue or the lining of your mouth elsewhere. You can get otalgia, which is a medical term for ear pain because the mouth shares a similar nerve with the um, ears. So even, even though you're, you're secondly not affecting your ears, you'll get pain. You can also have bleeding, swelling, and then pain in the mouth. Later symptoms, as the tumor progresses, you can get tongue weakness and numbness, so inability to move it as well. Um, limited mouth opening, which is called trismus. Adenopathy, so lymph nodes in your neck. Um, and then these things can change, basically, your speech and your swallowing. You get garbled speech because of the inability to move your tongue. And then ultimately, uh, airway obstruction or blocking your ability to breathe. So our first poll everywhere question, do you want me to read it? Oh, sure. Go for it. 
What is a common symptom of oral cavity cancer? A is taste disturbance, B is excessive saliva, C is loss of smell, and D is ear pain. All right, we'll, we'll take about another 10 seconds to give everyone a chance to answer that. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much to everyone for jumping in and, and uh, sharing your, your answer. Again, all anonymous, so uh, just give it your best guess. Dr. Lumley, how are they doing? They're ch it's changing. <laughs> <laughs> it's evolving. About a quarter of people have it correct. Right, and, and what answer were you looking for we're looking, and why? Here we're looking for ear pain. Um, as I described, um, the, the mouth shares a common nerve with the ear, and so with oral pain or mouth pain, you can get ear pain. So that's generally one of the earlier symptoms of cancer in the mouth. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Let's see you made oh, yeah. thank you. Yes. Yeah. All right. So far, well done, everyone. Um, so now we're going to talk about the oropharynx, a different subsite. So think about you just left the oral cavity and you're on that magic school bus, that cartoon that you used to do when you were a kid, and you're driven the magic school bus down the back of the tongue to the back of the palate where the tonsils are. So oropharynx cancer has gotten a lot of press probably in the last 10 to 15 years because of the HPV virus that people mentioned early on. Um, the epidemiology of this, so what causes oropharynx cancer, it's similar to what we talked about at the beginning. Smoking and alcohol were historically the cancers that we treated within the oropharynx. Now, we're seeing HPV as truly a rising causative factor. Uh, we see about 18,000 cases nationally, probably even more now, of HPV-positive oropharynx cancer. Uh, it's increasing by about 3% per year, and it is the cancer that's preventable by, by the Gardasil vaccine. Uh, it used to be that cervical cancer was the leading cause, was the leading HPV positive cancer, but now oropharynx cancer is the leading HPV positive cancer. When you think about where does this cancer kind of grow in the back of the throat, it's typically the tonsils or the base of the tongue. Uh, those are both areas that have a lot of lymphoid tissue, and lymphoid tissue seems to be the breeding ground for this um, viral infection induced cancer. If you look at this chart right here, this is an example of the impact of HPV. For many, many years, smoking and alcohol sort of triggered the um, causative factors for oropharynx cancer. But in the late 90s, early 2000s, we started seeing this new type of cancer arise, and this is the HPV trend, where we're seeing a, a gradual increase in the incidence or the number of cases per year. The, the population for this is a little bit different. Um, it's typically non-smokers. Uh, they typically don't have pain. Their initial symptom typically is a neck mass that doesn't cause symptoms. They're typically younger age uh, and sometimes can be in a different socioeconomic status. And so there are some challenges or some differences in managing patients when they have different risk factors. Over here, this is uh, an HPV positive oral pharynx cancer. It's a small little nodule on the back of the tongue. This is what normal lingual tonsil looks like. This is another one here in the back of the throat. And what we found is that HPV positive cancers have a much different uh, spectrum of illness as far as how you get it, the population that we see, the treatments that we give, and the response rates to treatment. So if you look at this kind of busier slide, the HPV negative patients and the oral cavity patients that Dr. Lumley just talked about share very similar demographics and presenting symptoms. They typically will present with pain, ear pain, which you talked about, uh, and they typically are older patients that are smokers and drinkers. Um, the HP positive is, again, a, a distinct population. We're seeing it as in young, as, in young patients as young as in the 20s, um, but also in 30s and 40s and 50 year olds. And the typical presenting symptom is just a, a bump in the neck that doesn't seem to go away. Usually not pain, uh, and that bump is usually a lymph node as a trigger. So with that, what is true about HPV-positive oral pharynx cancer? Uh, more advanced stage disease, on average, affects older populations. Is most common HPV-related cancer in the U.S.? There's no preventable therapy. And at this point, we'll open up the polls. Great. 
Again, thanks to everyone for jumping in so quickly and with those answers. And we'll have more to talk about with H with HPV positive orphanage cancer as we get farther into the talk. All right. Dr. Hackman, how did they do? You guys did awesome. 100%. 100%. <laughs> so next we're going to talk about laryngeal cancer or larynx cancer. Um, the larynx is known as the voice box. And so, again, similar to the other subsites that we already talked about, within the larynx there are multiple subsites. So there's the supraglottis, which basically means above the vocal cords. And you can see in this photo here um, that these structures, the epiglottis, um, is above the vocal cords, and that's called the supraglottis. The glottis is the actual vocal cords, and then subglottis means below the vocal cords, right as it gets into the trachea. So we'll talk about those there. Again, this uh, is showing basically at the anatomy of the um, larynx, and there are many things to see here, but to focus on briefly, just again, these light slits like lesions here, slit slit like areas, excuse me, here are the vocal cords. Um, and then everything above it is the supraglottis, and then essentially below is the subglottis before you get into the trachea. This is an endoscopic view, so when we look in, in our clinic with a flexible fiber optic laryngoscopy, which is a camera that goes through the nose to evaluate the back of the throat, this is the view that we will, we will get. And so these white cord-like areas are the true vocal cords, and then you have the false vocal cords right above it, and then the other structures that house the glottis, and then upper glottis here, and then base of tongue, which is what Dr. Hackman just talked about. So laryngeal cancer um, is still kind of along the same lines as what we talked about with the oral cavity cancer patients. Um, it's more common in, in older males generally. Again, tobacco is the highest risk factor and alcohol is additive. So a patient who smokes and drinks that um, essentially increases their risk about 65 times. The other types of things that can be risk factors for it is acid reflux or GERD. Um, virus, technically HPV can be associated with uh, laryngeal cancer, but it's not as no talked about. Prior radiation, other um, factors that you can be exposed to with work, um, such as wood dust, asbestos, asbestos excuse me, um, and then similar to the rest of the cancers, immunosuppression, so if your immune system is unable to fight off um, viruses as well. Generally, um, so looking at the different subsites of glottic, again, which essentially we're going to talk about as the vocal cords, an early sign is going to be hoarseness, so a hoarse voice. And generally, these patients um, can be treated for uh, the flu, you know, upper respiratory infection prior to really being diagnosed with cancer. A later symptom is going to be issues with both swallowing and breathing. Superglottic, which is the area above the vocal cords, is more subtle, they can have some throat pain, trouble swallowing, pain with swallowing, and that area has a higher risk of spreading to the lymph nodes on both sides of the neck, um, even if it's a really small tumor in that area. Here you can see on the left vocal cord, there's this kind of um, papular lesion, which has looks different than this nice smooth area, and that's the early um, lesion on the true vocal cord there. So there's been a lot of research looking at uh, treatment for early laryngeal cancer, looking at what we call um, preservation surgery or conservation surgery versus radiation. The goals are number one, obviously to treat the cancer, but also to preserve the patient's vocal cord function. So preserving their voice and their swallowing. Um, both surgery and radiation are highly effective for these early cancers. Although surgery has been shown to have um, better local control and decreased recurrence. This, cord, this picture all the way on the left here is that picture I showed you previously with the small lesion. And then here is an intraoperative photo where we use laser. So we'll use CO2 laser to excise the lesion. So you can see the excision site is a little bit bigger than what it looks like on the primary, the little tumor here because we take margins on it. And then this final, photo on the right is a photo back in clinic postoperatively after the patient has healed and so you can see how the vocal cord has um, healed over time and you see a little bit of scarring here. Mm. So we have our next poll question, what demographic factor favorably impacts prognosis? 
higher socioeconomic status, tobacco and alcohol, amino suppression, and male gender. And I will just point out that it says favorably, so what will make someone have a better outcome or better prognosis? Once you've clarified that, it shifted yeah. a little bit. <laughs> it's that trick question on the test. You yeah. Like, I didn't see that the teacher did that on purpose. Exactly. Great. Thank you for um, answering the question. So most people got it right. Higher socioeconomic status. And we'll often tell people um, what, what does horses sound like? It sounds like this. Like, you gotta sound like this. And you think about you know, the voice box, it's, it's, it's a musical instrument. Mine may be not so musical, but it's a musical instrument nonetheless. And so when you breathe, your vocal cords come apart. Mm -hmm. When you talk, they come together and they have some vertical height. And so when you, when you close them and you create pressure below, then the vocal cords billow and they undulate. And that undulation gives you a vibratory frequency. And if you make the chord very taut, like a guitar string, the frequency goes up, higher pitch. If you make the chord very loose, it goes down. So the male voice typically is a looser. The female voice is definitely tauter. And if you're somebody like a Christina Aguilera or something like that who can really change octaves, you can really stretch that chord very high. If you put any kind of small lesion in that area, all of a sudden the undulation isn't smooth. It's smooth. It becomes more bouncing around. And that gives you these multiple different sound waves leaving the voice box at the same time. And that's the diplophonia or the hoarseness is that it's not just one pure wave, it's multiple different waves at one time. And so it makes your voice sound funny. And so for patients who have laryngeal cancer, they tend to present earlier because voice sounding funny is typically a trigger, whereas a mild sore throat might get ignored. So typically the people who have voice box cancer, we see them earlier, people who have, that are on their vocal cords, people who have cancers above or below that it may be more insidious because the symptoms are more subtle. Um, last area before we get to salivary gland is going to be lip and skin. So lip and skin, we kind of put together because the risk factor for them is the same. It's basically um, sun exposure is the big thing. You'll also have the risk, again, of tobacco and alcohol, but sun exposure, especially for lower lip and for external skin, is, is huge. And let's face it, the face sees a ton of sun. Of all the body parts, it sees it the most. And there are certain areas on the face, like the bridge of the nose, the ears, where you might see more. Um, we also are much more educated as a society in the 2000s about our skincare than I think people were in the 1950s. And so now we're seeing an aging population of a lot of people who did not take care of their skin, did not protect their skin, because we didn't know better, who have skin cancers. Squamous cells, basal cells, these are common terms you might see. Basically, lesions that grow up on the face and, and can elaborate and grow into a cancer. Uh, the picture you're seeing on the top is a lower lip skin cancer from sun exposure, classic on the midline lower lip. This is a gentleman who uh, was using tobacco chew, uh, dipping, and uh, resulted in a cancer involving the, the lip and cheek from that. Uh, as I mentioned, there are areas of the, of the facial skin just by, by their protrusion out that you get more sun exposure and you'll see this this picture up here, these higher risk zones are where we see a lot more skin cancer because of where the sun hits our face. If you are immunosuppressed, again, you can't, your body can't repair the damage mechanism that is cancer, you're more likely to form cancer. And that's sort of one of the ways that cancer is able to grow in the immunosuppressed patient is that the immune system cannot keep up with the damage and the cycles of damage. And eventually that damaged cell is able to escape the immune system and proliferate and survive. Mm -hmm. um, we think about fair skin, so again, the more fair your skin, the less melanin you have to protect against sun rays, the more likely you have skin cancer as well. And then the P&I, we'll, we'll talk about later, that's what's called perineural invasion. We'll get to that a little bit later when we talk about risk factors for cancer. Um, the prognosis for skin cancer is typically pretty good if it's caught early. So oftentimes, patients don't come to our door uh, with early onset skin cancers, they're seeing their local dermatologist, they're having Mohs surgery, they're, they're taking out these small lesions, sometimes using ointments, sometimes freezing them off, sometimes removing them surgically. When they become more advanced, that's typically when they come to our door. What makes them more advanced is when they are bigger, more than three centimeters, it's about that big. Um, if they have evidence of lymph nodes being involved, which happens about 10% of the time, or if it looks like it's invading into nerve endings in the soft tissue. 
Think about nerve endings as the highway system for your body. Think about the lymphatics like the normal traffic patterns. And so I tell my patients that any tumor, I call that Grand Central Station, all the lymph nodes are train stops along the way. And the cancer is going to try and get the, to the different train stops through all the different tracks that connect through the body. The nerves are more like highways that take you to places very quickly. And so if there's evidence of invasion in the lymphatics or if there's evidence of invasion into the nerves, those cancers may have the ability to spread beyond the point of where we first see them. And those things are the, what we call the higher risk factors because that cancer is on the move and it's more difficult to control. Um, again, the nodal positivity rate is about, uh, about 10 to 15%. It's, it's greater the bigger the tumor because the bigger the tumor, the more access to potential channels and highway systems it has. Um, if it's at the corner of the mouth, it's closer to those systems as well. And then the deeper down it gets, think about your skin is kind of like having, it's sort of like an apartment building. There's like seven floors, then there's a basement, and then there's the subterranean level. If the cancer gets through the basement into that subterranean subtoid system, that's when it can spread. So once cancer is going to get below that level, that's when they are more difficult to control. Um, things that we think about in all of our cancers, but especially skin cancers and lip cancers, is form and function. Because if I take off a significant portion of the lip, I affect my ability to eat, to open my mouth, to do oral care. And so part of our job as surgeons and as oncologists in general is to not only, number one, try and manage and treat the cancer, but do so and try and maintain as much form and function as we can. One of the adages that people say about head and neck cancer is that you can't hide head and neck cancer. It's out in the open. Lung cancer, breast cancer, sometimes you can hide those things because you're not exposing those throughout the day. But head and neck cancer, your ability to talk, to swallow, to enjoy a meal, or even your facial appearance uh, is really tied to the management of, your can of the cancer. And so we spend a lot of time thinking not only about what's the best oncologic treatment, best cancer treatment, but also how do we preserve form and function? How do we hide incisions? How do we reconstruct the lip like up here so that we can make this lip go away, but long-term have things heal, and when it heals, have it look like you have a relatively normal lip, knowing that we can't make anything perfect. And so we have a variety of different ways we can do that. There's reconstructive options, just pulling tissue together, rotating tissues in, taking some of the upper lip and making it into the lower lip, um, a lot of different reconstructive options that we'll get into later. And that's the second part about what we do. It's just not cancer survival. It is also how does somebody have that survivorship and function and feel comfortable in society having gone through treatment. So here's this gentleman who had a large cancer. Uh, and again, it's going to require removal of at least half of the lip um, up to the corner of the mouth. And it also, you can't tell in the picture, but the entire inside of the right cheek is damaged by cancer. And so this person needed a reconstructive surgery. And what we ended up doing was we relined the entirety of his inside of his cheek with tissue that we transferred from his arm. We took some of that and reconstructed the outside of his chin here. We took some of his upper lip here and we folded it down to make him a lower lip. And his mouth is a little tighter, but at least it gives him form and function. And it looks like he's got some surgical incisions, but hopefully not as significant as before when he came in with the large lesion. Here's another patient, nasal skin cancer. So this is again, sun exposure with a full and full thick thickness defect where you're looking at the inside of his nose at the septum. That's the part that divides the left and the right side of the nose. And this area, we take a little uh, piece of tissue from the cheek, we fold it over, sew it in, and that will heal up and you'll hide that incision in his skin crease so that long-term, this will look like the native fold in his skin that he has and this will color match his nose, so it will hide much more uh, easily long-term. So having said that, we are now gonna transition to our workup for head and neck cancer, and I'll have Dr. Lumley take it from here. Perfect, so once someone comes to us um, with a suspected or a diagnosis of cancer, the first step is to either confirm a diagnosis and then start our workup. So workup generally is going to consist of first of imaging as well as biopsy. When we talk about imaging, basically that helps us evaluate what's going on underneath the skin. 
So for classic, you know, mouth or throat cancer patient, a CAT scan, which is a CT neck computed tomography, and chest um, with contrast is the gold standard. And that really helps us look at what is the tumor involving or budding? Is it invading any structures? It helps us look at the vessels because we use contrast. So the arteries and veins that go up and down the neck will have contrast in them so we can look at the tumor proximity to those things at the bone, looking at if the mandible or the jawbone is invading um, structures. The top left scan, scan here, this is a CAT scan. This is showing basically a multi-lobulated tumor here um, with central necrosis. So the center of the tumor is darker, that lining of the tumor here is brighter, and that is all kind of a budding, is, is within the neck and the lymph nodes. It's pushing the carotid artery and the internal jugular vein out towards the back of the neck and a budding up to the oropharynx, basically. Um, and so that, that's kind of our, one of our first steps. Another type of imaging study we'll get is a PET scan, and that's a basically full body scan looking for tumor spread outside of the primary site, and it basically uses um, radioactive sugar, essentially, looking for rapidly um, dividing cells, so helping us know not only, yes, that, that there's tumor here, which is bright yellow in the voice box and a lymph node, but it'll also look at the lungs the bones elsewhere, the kidneys, et cetera. And then lastly, we'll generally use a MRI, and that helps us specifically look for soft tissue involvement or any nerve involvement. So we're looking for, um, for example, if a skin cancer is overlying the cheek and if it's going deep and involving the facial nerve, which is the nerve that controls your face, we're looking at if that nerve um, lights up bright uh, or if it spreads elsewhere. And then again, if the patient does not have a confirmed biopsy, we're confirming the biopsy with a diagnosis um, in order to plan, uh, diagnose it and then plan for surgery. Um, staging for head and neck cancer, I don't think we necessarily need to go through, but basically as Dr. Hackman slight, brie, briefly mentioned is the bigger the tumor, the bigger the stage. And then we also look at the depth, so in the mouth, basically how far does it go from the lining of the tongue or the cheek into the underlying muscle or fat, um, and then if, if it's invading any structures. All of those things, so if it's bigger, so the diameter of it is bigger, if it is deeper into the structures, or if it's invading any um, surrounding muscles, bone, etc., it's going to be a higher stage. And then, so that's T for tumor, N is for nodal. Again, looking at the lymph nodes of the neck, so um, number of lymph nodes involved, if it's on the same side as the tumor or both sides, and then if it is spreading outside of the capsule of a lymph node. Anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, I would, so, no, it's a good question. So this slide, I wouldn't necessarily focus on, like Dr. Lim was saying, the content of it. It's more to tell you that the system is, the stage system is complex. The, the general rule of thumb we tell our patients is that smaller tumors do really well. What we also know by the literature, and this is mainly for the smoking and drinking population, is that once you have a lymph node involved in the neck, it drops the survival by 50% mm -hmm. on average. Now, what I tell patients is that people aren't percentages. And so they'll ask, well, what are, what's the percent that, I, that I'm gonna, that I'm gonna survive this cancer? the it's binary either we're going to be successful and we're going to treat you and you're going to you're going to get cured of cancer or you're not if you look at population statistics how did 100,000 people do well the survival for stage one head and neck cancer again the subsets are different oral cavity larynx oral pharynx the survival is roughly about 90 percent stage two it's like high 70s low 80s stage three it goes down to 55 and stage four it goes to like 45. why do those numbers change because typically you go from stage two down to stage three and four, it's because there's a lymph node involved. So just anecdotally, if you're talking at a, if we're giving a talk at a conference or you're talking to about population statistics to somebody in the public health school, you would say nodal involvement drops your survival at 50%. That being said, having taken care of patients for 15 years, I have people who have had earlier stage cancers who have not done well and people who have had late stage cancers that are still doing amazing. So again, numbers only matter if they apply to you, and so I tell that to all our patients. But if you have a lymph node involved, that usually portends a, a poor prognosis, and it's based on what we said earlier. Once a cancer figures out how to spread, 
you don't know how far down the subway system it's gotten, and realize, and we tell patients this all the time, imaging studies are not perfect. A PET CT scan, as Dr. Lumley mentioned, works by radio-labeled sugar. And what it means is that cancers are metabolically active. They're churning and, and, and working very hard, so they're eating a lot of sugar, so they light up on PET scan. So is your brain. If you do a PET scan on a treadmill, your legs would light up. The problem is that, is that you can't necessarily tell if that activity in the lymph node is because of cancer or if they have an infection. So if I have a dental abscess, my PET scan will be positive. But in the cancer patient, if we see areas that light up on PET, that makes us more concerned that there's something metabolically active, like the, body, the, the cell's really using a lot of sugar, and that means cancer. The challenge is you need about 100 million cells clustered together to generate a big enough signal for that to be positive. That's about seven millimeters of tissue. So that what I always tell patients is that a negative PET scan makes us feel good, but it doesn't, it's not perfect, which is why people can have recurrences, because if the cell population is small enough, we can't see it. It's just like you can't see your house from space at night if you flip the lights on. But if everybody in the eastern seaboard at the same time flipped their lights on, the space station would see a blip. They'd see like a little spot that come out. That's the, the relative number that we need to see on a scan. And so the imaging tools are helpful. They, we, we use them, but they're not perfect. Um, and this is what we were talking about. What, what drops survival? Um, stage one and stage two do better. Stage three and stage four, they do worse. And the biggest things that drop that is that if we can't fully remove the tumor, so positive margins, um, if they already have disease in their chest, um, it's sort of past the point of us to surgically operate. It's gone too far. Uh, and then if they have lymph nodes involved, specifically if you think about lymph nodes as kind of like contained structures, if the cancer is inside the lymph node, it's still kind of contained. If it starts to break outside the lymph node, there's no longer like a fence around it. It's kind of like a wild horse. It's running free. We have a harder time corralling it. So when we see disease in the chest, when we see uh, we can't take the whole tumor out, or we see that lymph nodes are involved, a number of them are involved, or they're not even containing the cancer, those are all what we consider higher risk features, and that sort of drives the prognosis. Um, but again, it still is a binary thing. We still treat people with curative intent, provided that we think that they still have that opportunity, and that means giving them the full course of therapy, unless we know, for example, they have distant disease and we can't control things. Um, the uniqueness to HPV is that it's a totally different conversation from what we just had. So this is what's so confusing, is that if I were to come in and Dr. Lumley were to see me as a patient, and I'm a smoker, and I've got a lymph node in my neck, or say I've got two, I'm stage four my survival is 45%. Now I come into Dr. Lemon's clinic, I'm not a smoker, I've got three lymph nodes in the neck, and I've got an HP positive tumor, I'm stage one. So, totally confusing. The bottom line is that people who have the virally driven tumors just tend to do better. Um, it probably has to do with the fact that smoking causes truly damage to our DNA that's hard to repair, Whereas the virus seems to more like suppress it, and then we're able to remove that suppression with treatment, is the way I would kind of think about it. Um, so with that, we can typically give lower dose therapy uh, to HPV positive patients. We can treat them surgically, uh, and sometimes surgery alone. Sometimes we can even treat them with immunotherapy, and they have a far better response and outcome on average than our patients who are smoking and drinking. So, what is the imaging study best for assessing nerve invasion? All right, and again, just just take your best shot on this. Uh, no, we won't we won't get back to you if you miss it. <laughs> yeah, and 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 we typically get a lot of CT scans in our practice mainly because the acquisition time is fast. So people who don't like being in scanners, they'll be fine. They're, they're relatively less expensive than MRIs and, and, and PET scans, and they can help us to stage the primary side of the neck. We like MRI scans when we're looking for soft tissue definition, like multiple different soft tissues and how they look like next to each other. Whereas when we're looking at like, the, is bone invaded? Sometimes CT is better. And then the PET, again, as Dr. Lundley mentioned, is sort of that way to kind of see where is, where is their functional activity. 
So yeah, we do use for MRI for a lot of soft tissue and nerve would be considered a soft tissue. Perfect. All right, I think you can use it. Okay. So as Dr. Hackman briefly mentioned earlier, um, cancer care, all cancer care, but um, since we're talking about head and neck cancer today, obviously, our um, treatment approach to patients with head and neck cancer is multidisciplinary. So we very take very much pride in this here at uh, University of North Carolina that we have a multidisciplinary tumor board where the surgeons, the medical oncologists, the radiation oncologists, the radiologists, the speech pathologists, there's a large, and pathologists, they're all um, on the board and we make all care decisions together as a board. Um, so that's where we're talking about the joint conference to discuss best options for each patient. We talk about whether or not the patient is a um, candidate for a, an ongoing clinical trial. We talk about these difficult cases that Dr. Hackman mentioned where if they have a recurrent cancer and we've exhausted one avenue of treatment, you know, how can we um, uh, individualize their care better based on their tumor and their DNA and, and what type of cancer it is. Um, it has been shown that treatment outcomes are superior in designated cancer centers. Um, and generally, uh, that's secondary to having patient, having uh, physicians who are specialized in cancer treatment. We have more um, ancillary staffs and more nutritionists on board, speech pathologists, which play a large role in our um, patient population, different therapists. Um, and there has been a survival benefit, even though patients have to travel further. So a large population of our patients travel three, four, five hours to undergo treatment here at UNC, but because of our multiple, multidisciplinary approach, um, it, ha it shows a benefit. So again, um, there's different treatment options, and so our treatment avenues, if you will, surgery um, is generally considered the standard of care for primary therapy for nasal, so in the nose and oral cavity or mouth cancers. Um, it's also considered standard of care for early stage, so that T1, T2, smaller oropharynx tumors, so tonsil and base of tongue. Um, and again, like Dr. Hackman uh, briefly alluded to, the HPV oropharyngeal cancers can be treated with robotic surgery. And then early laryngeal cancer, like we speak, spoke about um, earlier in the talk, with using laser surgery. Uh, as ca laryngeal cancer progresses and starts to basically spread outside of the cartilage of the voice box that houses the vocal cords and spreads into the soft tissues of the neck, that's considered advanced and makes it basically non-functional. So the vocal cords are no longer allowing you to breathe or speak or swallow and food's going into your windpipe. At that point, surgery is also considered for laryngeal cancer, which is where we remove a, your voice box, essentially. The goals of surgery are um, obviously to remove the cancer. We get mucosal margin, so we take normal tissue surrounding the tumor, which we usually aim for about a centimeter of margins. Um, in the operating room, we send those margins off to the pathologist to look at it right then and there to tell us you know, whether or not we have any residual cancer potentially in that area. Um, it, it's just a preliminary result, but that's what we generally standard of care uh, do. And the other goals are maintaining function, so maintaining either, either whether it be swallowing, speaking, um, et cetera, the goal is to try to maintain function um, and then remove the lymph nodes, which is called a neck dissection. So removing lymph nodes that we know that specific tumor is going to spread to. So in the mouth, um, we're usually removing the lymph nodes in the upper neck here, um, and the larynx is gonna be the upper and the lower neck. And so we know where these places are gonna to spread to and we'll remove them at the time of surgery. This is what I just alluded to, lymph node and neck dissection. So indications for neck surgery um, are removing the lymph nodes. So if we know that it has spread to um, a lymph node already, whether that be from biopsy proven, um, which is done using a needle biopsy or um, concern for it on imaging uh, is an indication for doing neck dissection. The risk of occult or basically hidden nodal metastases is about 20% as tumors get bigger, uh, T2, so basically greater than two centimeters or bigger. And as I alluded to earlier as well, the depth of the tumor, so how deep the tumor goes from the lining of, for instance, the tongue into the muscles of your tongue, if it's 
deeper than four millimeters, that risk of there being lymph node um, metastasis, even though we don't see it on imaging, is 20%. And so for those things, so deeper tumors greater than four millimeters or a tumor greater than two centimeters in diameter, we do what we call an elective neck dissection. So again, even though we don't see cancer in them, we remove the lymph nodes because of that risk. The levels are, that are dissected, again, depend on the primary site. So the floor of the mouth or the tongue is gonna be levels one through four. And as you can see in this photo here, the levels are separated out by anatomic um, landmarks. Um, it, we are operating around important structures such as the nerve that controls the movement of the tongue, the movement of the shoulder, the carotid artery, and the internal jugular vein. And the goals are to um, preserve those throughout the surgery. And then again, this is similar to what we have spoken to as well, but what affects outcomes? So what from surgery affects it? So positive margins, again, if we can't get that whole tumor out, um, that's gonna lead to a worse prognosis. Lymphovascular space invasion. So is the tumor invading lymphatic space? Dr. Hackman referred to that as the subway system. I call them estuaries. Um, so if it looks like microscopic cells have invaded that system, then they have a, they have a way to reach distant areas um, throughout the body. And again, perineural invasion, so like Dr. Hagman said, a highway, so inv involving either a small or a large nerve, which we would see on pathology, puts, us at, puts patients at um, a higher risk for recurrence and worse survival. And then again, nodal metastasis, so in the pathology, if more than two lymph nodes um, are positive or if there's extra capsular extension or invasion where it's going outside of the node, that um, is worse as well. Sure. So, um, and then we'll try and get through the rest of this and we can end the talk for maybe a few minutes for questions. Basically, radiation therapy is the other option for head and neck cancer besides surgery. Um, you, to do it effectively, it has to be done five days a week for about six to seven weeks. And that's because cells are only sensitive during a certain phase of cell cycle, kind of like a clock. And so you can't just radiate somebody one day because not every cell is on the same clock cycle. And so they have to come in for daily therapy five days a week. Usually it's done through a CT scan and then they create this computer simulation. I tell patients it's kind of like a topographical hiking map. So they'll say this is the hot spot here and then they'll draw each kind of topographical map line afterwards. There's a dose de-escalation of radiation therapy. And they do that so they can map out and like prevent dose to the spine. So they can create these three dimensional maps and then they plug that three-dimensional map into a computer, and then the computer will generate radiation beams based on that. And then you wear this very tight-fitting mesh mask that kind of holds you down to the table in the same spot every single time, and you come in, they put you in the table, they strap you down, you go into the CT scanner or the radiation machine, you get treated, you come back out. And like a bad version of Groundhog Day, you keep doing that over and over again five days a week for about six to seven weeks. Um, it's a very effective primary therapy for a lot of cancers. And then if we have a high-risk cancer that we've operated on, we typically will add it on as well. But it is more and more commonly being used as a primary therapy for certain types of laryngeal cancers. If we have, if the only option we have is to take the voice box out, sometimes we will try this instead. Um, if we know people have a lot of lymph nodes involved, sometimes we'll treat them primarily with radiation therapy because as we alluded to earlier, if you have a lot of lymph nodes afterwards, your prognosis is not as good. And after surgery, you're going to get radiation anyways. So if we can avoid doing surgery, we might do radiation therapy up front. That's true for the oropharynx, tonsil back of the tongue. That's true for the voice box. For the oral cavity, it's not the same. Treating the oral cavity with primary radiation therapy is still not the standard of care, both from a standpoint of being effective and from the pain from it. There's a lot of side effects with radiation therapy, and so if we don't have to give it, we don't. Those include like those include significant sunburn or effects because basically it's burning away tissue, exposure of jawbone and, and fractures, um, having what we call radiation necrosis. It's a very effective cancer therapy, but what it does is it damages the cells that are repl replicating. It also damages the microvascular or the small blood vessels that feed all of the structures in the area that great, got radiated. It can affect your taste, it can affect swallowing, it can affect saliva production, it can affect the health of your teeth long term. And what I tell my patients is it's hard to grow like prize winning vegetables in a garden that has no soil. One of the downsides of radiation therapy is that it, it takes away the, the healthiness of the soil, which are the support structures in your, in your mouth. 
So your jawbone blood supply is not as good. It has a harder time holding on to your teeth. And so if there are some side effects with treatment, sometimes it's we're, we're weighing treating the cancer, but if, if we are weighing those effects and there's an option outside of radiation therapy, some of these factors come into play. So what factors require post-operative radiation therapy? There you go. You always like that question on test, right? Because it's like, yeah, they all sound like they're right. Um, don't you wish every multiple choice question was like that? Um, but yes, it is. So positive margins, nerve invasion, bone invasion, and, and adenopathy, all of these um, tell us that the cancer is higher risk and we're more likely to give radiation therapy either up front or um, after surgery. Um, chemotherapy, just briefly, it's something that's given as an addition to radiation. It's not a primary therapy at this point for cancer. Um, there are some newer treatments called immunotherapy. You may have seen commercials for Keytruda on TV. Um, it has some significant benefit for patients who have cancers that have not responded to other therapies, but it's probably too, too early to make that a primary therapy. Um, my prediction, in the next 15 to 20 years, we will see probably chemotherapy or and or immunotherapy become more of a primary therapy in the treatment of head and neck cancer. It's just not there yet. Um, immunotherapy really has probably changed that landscape a little bit. Um, and the way immunotherapy works is it basically targets your immune system to open up the ability to see cancer cells. The reason cancer cells survive, or one of the reasons they survive, is that they can hide in plain sight. The receptors that they block on what are called your T cells, which are like your the immune cells that, that kill bacteria and things that shouldn't be there, they block T cell receptors. And then the cancer cells themselves sometimes have receptors on them that are not open. And so immunotherapy removes that blockade on the immune cells. So all of a sudden the immune cells can recognize that cell shouldn't be here and attacks it. And so the idea about immunotherapy is priming the immune system to recognize what shouldn't be there amongst all the other cells and attacking those cells. And so immunotherapy has, for some cancers, been a significant game changer in our treatment pathways. Uh, we probably don't have time to cover all of salivary neoplasm. So in the initial time, there are major salivary glands. Um, there's two, two up here and two down here and then two in the front. We don't see them. We, we take care of these kind of cancers uh, less frequently. Um, these uh, tumors are most likely benign salivary tumors. Uh, they usually present as a, as a painless mump, uh, a lump. Um, but the smaller the gland, the more likely it could be a malignancy. So we tell people anytime they have a lump in the cheek is the risk that it could be a salivary tumor. Uh, it's a small fraction of head and neck cancers that we take care of. The biggest risk of, of, of surgery for these patients is the risk that they may have damage to nerve structures. So the parotid gland houses in the middle of it, like a sandwich, the nerve that controls how your face moves. And if we were to damage or cut that nerve, it's as if you had a stroke on that side. And so one of the risks of parotid surgery, taking a parotid tumor out, is the risk to that facial nerve. We do our best to try to preserve that during surgery using nerve monitoring and, and special techniques. But also the risk of leaving that tumor in there, especially if it's malignant, is that it could involve that nerve and cause that paralysis on its own or then use that nerve as a highway to go forward or to go backward. And so that's one of the reasons why we advocate for surgery, especially in the cancers or some of the more pre-malignant lesions. Um, we can skip through that. We will, I'll briefly mention, because I think we only have like a few, mom, few minutes yeah, left. a couple minutes left. That we're gonna skip past reconstructive surgery because that's too much. We'll end here by saying that our head and neck cancer population is very diverse. We have a lot of different patients to take care of. Younger children, younger adults, older adults, some common risk factors, smoking and alcohol that are modifiable. If people drink less, they don't smoke, we can prevent those cancers. And then the virus cause. If people use the Gardasil vaccine for their children, HPV positive or advanced cancer will probably cease to exist. And so our goals are to, how do we harm our patients the least? And, and how do we take care of them the best? And we thank you for tuning in. I know Kathy, anything else? No, that's great. We appreciate you coming and um, we're always available if you ever have questions. Great, and that, that was phenomenal. Can we go ahead and advance to, we're gonna get to that 
question and answer slide, and then uh, we'll go ahead and give our audience an opportunity to uh, share their questions through Poll Everywhere. Yeah. So just Whoa. a moment there, and you can pass down that uh, the keyboard. Thank you so much. Sorry, we missed showing you some kind of cool videos of reconstructions <laughs> that we do, but that would take cool part of our job. That would take more more time. We do we do arts and crafts where we take things apart and put them back together again. Um, maybe another time. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. that that was amazing. Keep going um, so we so we'll wait for any questions from our audience to come in. And while we're waiting, um, I know one of the questions that I had. I know, I know you uh, mentioned some of the facial cancers and talked about melanoma. So we have a whole separate group of of uh, healthcare professionals that deal with melanoma, have their own melanoma tumor board. What's the crossover between head and neck cancer and melanoma, or or where yeah. where yeah. where are some of the other kind of fuzzy lines between yeah. what the two of you do and what some of the other uh, healthcare professionals in other areas do? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and we do have crossover. And again, it's similar to the rest of our patient population. It's multidisciplinary, and so there are a lot of times that we are working with the surgical oncology group to um, help with an advanced surgery, whether we're helping with reconstruction or a different you know, part of the surgery. Um, we do see some melanoma patients um, just through referral patterns uh, on our own, but we also work closely with the medical oncologists who um, generally treat melanoma, sometimes first line with chemotherapy as well. So we are very involved and it's a very um, multidisciplinary approach as well. Yeah, I would agree. I did. Most melanoma is probably managed by our, there's a melanoma treatment team uh, that Tim is referring to. We tend to get involved when it becomes internal. So you can have actually melanoma on the mouth and in the nose. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's an area that we're comfortable operating in. Or if it becomes a very large resection because we may have to not only remove it but reconstruct. Mm -hmm. uh, so earlier stage skin cancers are typically managed by a dermatologist or our melanoma treatment team. And then the other area that we kind of cross over is, and we manage thyroids, I didn't put on here, but we take care of thyroid cancer as well, as do, as do our, our general endocrine surgeons. So there's a little crossover in management of thyroid cancers. Uh, we tend to, again, manage the ones that are significant, that require a lot of resection and reconstruction. So when it becomes sort of a more complex removal, that's sort of when our team is brought in on these other types of cancers. Gotcha. Thank you so much. We do have a question from the audience. Thank you. Uh, is vaping considered a risk factor as well? Great question. That is a great question. Um, the science is still evolving on this. The guarded answer would be yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there is still not a lot of control as to what's in certain vaping products. Early ones that came out had formaldehyde in them. Um, so just smoking formaldehyde can't be good for your health. The, the, the early literature is that there is some danger from vaping. We don't have hard, fast numbers like we do with smoking as to what is the percentage risk factor, um, what type of things will it cause, but there are some concerns about inhalation of some of the substances that are, that are vaping substances and knowing that some of them are carcinogenic. Uh, and it's, they don't really have great data on, on how controlled the formulations are from one product to another, as well as what the other components are that are put in. That's what I know latest in the science. Um, I don't know if you know No, I, that's, yeah, it's, it's, jury's still out, but like Dr. Hagman said, guarded answer is yes. Right, thank you. And then um, Dr. Hackman, earlier on you mentioned that the, the head and neck cancers can be very difficult because unlike some of the other cancers, this is an air, in an area that you can't cover up as easily and this is also our, our, our modes of communication, our facial communication, our speech can be impacted. Uh, how do you work with other professionals who may be dealing with some of the psychological aspects of, of a head and neck cancer? I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, unfortunately, my planning wasn't very good when we built this talk because that was like the last five slides. <laughs> oh, there so we I'm, go. <laughs> so I'm glad you brought it up. Um, but yeah, cancer survivorship is tough. It's one thing to survive the cancer, but it's true. Um, patients who we treat may not be able to eat a meal the same way. They may take, and their family doesn't get it because they may even look pretty normal, but their throat may not work the same. So they may have a lot more trouble eating certain foods, or it may take every effort they have to finish a meal, and by the time they're done, everyone else has finished a half hour ago, or they can only eat so much, or it's awkward when they're eating, and so it can be socially isolating. Um, 
So we work with behavioral health team. We work with our cancer support team. We have professional patients who have gone through this treatment, and we have them all sort of um, advocate because there's a high rate of what's called adjustment disorder, which is depression associated with illness, in the head and neck cancer population Mm -hmm. because we take away or we modify what makes us human. Our ability to communicate, to socialize, to congregate, a lot of that can get affected. We do a very, we, we try our best to minimize that, but you can never eliminate it. And so that, and that, that is a big component is making sure you're managing the, 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 the psychological expectations of the patient, but also making sure that the family gets that the patient has all these limitations that they may not perceive. Right. Uh, and educating both the patient in front of the family about some strategies. Thank you so much. And uh, I, you know, I think one of the things that's a, a good takeaway for our audience today is that there are so many different professionals involved in in identifying and, and treating and caring for these patients at a variety of stages. So this isn't about any one healthcare practitioner. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of different roles here at the, at the, that are involved with, with caring for these patients. Yeah, so I think as Dr. Lemley said, what makes our center great is that, in one of our last slides, it's like it's the surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, nutritionists, speech therapists, physical therapists, lymphedema therapists, psychiatric counselors, behavioral health, mm-hmm. tobacco cessation. Yeah. It requires, it, it's not it's the, the adage, it takes a village, yeah. and it really does. Yeah, and for those of you listening in a community college healthcare program or considering healthcare, a lot of different areas that, that you, oncology is a very broad field, and there are a lot of different things that, that you can do to support patients. All right, I want to say some thank yous. I want to thank the people of North Carolina for their generous support of the University Cancer Research Fund and the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. We want to thank the whole team behind the scenes, Benny Obore and John Powell and Oliver Marth, Andrew Dodgson, Nadja Brown, Pat Muscarella for all of their hard work for all of these lectures.